So good afternoon, everyone, uh, to our distinguished guests in the room and online and our esteemed panelists. My name is Jessica Sweet, and on behalf of the Belfer Center's Defense Project and Irregular Warfare Initiative, I welcome you to our panel discussion on PRC gray zone activities in the Western Hemisphere. Today, we are honored to have three renowned experts who will shed light on the challenges the People's Republic of China presents to the security and stability of the Western Hemisphere. Before we begin, this session will be recorded and posted to the Belfer and IWI's social media platform following today's discussion. Now, I'd like to set the stage by highlighting the landscape in which we find ourselves. First, gray zone activities involve a wide range of tactics that fall between traditional peace and armed conflict. These hybrid tactics can include economic coercion, irregular warfare, disinformation campaigns, cyber operations, and other forms of influence and interference. In recent years, China's presence in the Western Hemisphere, and in particular, Latin America, has grown exponentially. <clears throat> this is driven for its need for resources and market access to advance its global ambitions. As a result, China has become the region's second largest trading partner, followed by the United States. According to the World Economic Forum, in the past two decades, Trade with the Chinese increased 26-fold from 12 billion to 315 billion and is expected to double by 2035. Today, 21 countries in the region, to include seven in South America, participate in the PRC's Belt and Road Initiative, and Chinese foreign investment includes sectors such as energy, infrastructure, space, telecommunications, and mining. However, the PRC's engagement in the region is not purely economic. In its quest for national rejuvenation, it is also driven by strategic interests to expand its presence on the global stage and secure its diplomatic support in the international fora. To achieve these goals, the PRC employs a wide range of indirect and non-military tools at their disposal, including political influence and criminal activities such as illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. The United States recognizes the importance of addressing these gray zone activities to maintain its comparative advantage and the stability of alliances in the Western Hemisphere. Our moderator for today's discussion, Mr. Guido Torres. Guido is a National Security Fellow at the Belfer Center's Defense Project and the Director of Engagements for the Regular Warfare Initiative. With over two decades of experience, Guido has focused on the Indo-Pacific region and the Western Hemisphere contributing to national security topics related to Latin America, the Caribbean, strategic competition, and irregular forms of warfare. Our first panelist, Melissa Dalton, who's joining us online, was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Hemispheric Affairs in March 2022. She is responsible for advising the Secretary and other senior leaders on the defense community's continuity and mission assurance homeland defense and defense support of civil authorities, Arctic and global resilience, and US defense and security policy for Canada, Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and South America. Ms. Dalton was a senior fellow and deputy director for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, International Security Program, and director for the Cooperative Defense Project. Her CSIS research focused on reinforcing the principles foundations of US defense strategy and military operations. Our second panelist, Admiral Craig Fowler, US Navy retired, commanded US Southcom from 2018 to 2021, where he led a diverse team of 7,000 people. In this role, he enhanced the Western Hemispheric security by building strong, trusted partnerships between the US military and Latin American and Caribbean security forces. His team rapidly responded to a myriad of complex security challenges to include transnational criminal organizations, the Venezuelan crisis, the global pandemic, hurricanes Ida and Iota in November 2020, and the August 2021 Haiti earthquake. Adam Fowler is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Hurst Latin America Center and Snowcraft Center for Strategy and Security. He is also currently a senior fellow at the National Defense University and a Florida International University. And he is on the advisory board of the Penn State Applied Research Laboratory. Lastly, we are joined by Dr. Ryan Berg. Dr. Ryan Berg is the Director of America's Program and Head of the Future of Venezuela Initiative at CSIS. He is also an adjunct professor at the Catholic University of America 
and visiting research fellow at University of Oxford's Changing Character of War program. His research focuses on US Latin American relations, authoritarian regimes, armed conflict, strategic competition, trade and development issues. He also studies Latin America's criminal groups and the region's governance and security challenges. Previously, Dr. Berg served as a research consultant at the World Bank, a Fulbright Scholar in Brazil, and a visiting doctoral fellow at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. We're excited to have these distinguished experts join us today for an insightful conversation. Guido, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jessica. I'm delighted to serve as your moderator today for this Project Grey Zone event, uh, and I'm truly grateful to, for this opportunity uh, to engage with you all. Today's discussion will be divided into three segments. Uh, first, our panelists will provide their opening comments, outlining the perspectives on gray zone activities in the Western Hemisphere and their potential implications for regional security and stability. Next, we'll, we'll move on to our moderated discussion where our panelists will delve into some examples of gray zone activities, assess the effectiveness of current policy responses, and explore potential countermeasures and strategies. Finally, we'll open the floor to questions from our distinguished audience uh, allowing for a broader and more interactive dialogue. As we embark on this intellectual journey, we hope to foster a better understanding of the complexities and nuances of China's indirect approach in the hemisphere and to identify potential policy recommendations for mitigating their negative impact on the region and, and their stability and, and prosperity. We also seek to enhance cooperation among countries in the region and strengthen the international rules-based order uh, to effectively address the challenges posed by China's rise. The security environment posed by China's activities in the region are complex and multifaceted. On one hand, China's pr uh, presence can bring benefits such as economic growth, infrastructure development, and technological transfers. But on the other hand, they can also pose significant risks such as debt traps, political interference, erosion of democratic norms, and the loss of strategic autonomy. To address these challenges, the Department of Defense has adopted a new national defense strategy identified the PRC as the United States' most consequential strategic competitor in the department's pacing challenge. Recently, the joint staff released its new joint operating concept for competing, which diverges from typical military uh, practices and illustrates how the military dimension contributes to the national strategy by enabling other departments and agencies within the U.S. government. In short, integrated deterrence and integrated campaigning. With this context in mind, let us turn to our panelists for their insights and perspectives. Uh, to open today's discussion, I'd like for each of you to provide your opening remarks. To begin, let's start by addressing what the PRC's gray zone activities are, why they use these methods, and why it's important in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, to begin, I'd like to start with you, uh, Assistant Secretary Dalton. Great to, to see you, and uh, thank you for, for providing some time there. Um, Guido, you know, thanks so much for arranging this terrific panel discussion on a really important and, and timely topic. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I'm going to keep my opening thoughts um, pretty short so, so we can get into the discussion. Um, to, to answer your first question, I'll turn to DOD's North Star, which is our 2022 National Defense Strategy. The NDS addresses this uh, very real challenge, the threat posed by the People's Republic of China or the PRC, and the operations that they undertake in the gray zone. Both the PRC and their gray zone activities intersect in complex in consequential ways in the Western Hemisphere. To break that down a bit, um, the NDS identifies the PRC as DOD's pacing challenge because it poses the most comprehensive and serious challenge to U.S. national security. The PRC is using coercive and increasingly aggressive endeavors to refashion the international system to suit its interests and authoritarian preferences. To achieve this, the PRC undertakes a wide array of activities in what we call the gray zone, namely those coercive asymmetric activities existing between peace and war. By design, these activities advance PRC objectives without triggering a kinetic response from the Department of Defense or other actors. Examples of these activities include illicit finance, illegal fishing, economic coercion and predatory investments, sometimes for and masking military advantages or purposes, information and disinformation operations and influence campaigns, cyber attacks against critical infrastructure, offers of military cooperation, scientific exchanges, and information technology assistance with potential nefarious intent. And these gray zone activities occur amidst a persistent PRC expansion of diplomatic, technological, informational, military, and economic enticements 
to our partners in the region. It thrives in the context of rapidly changing domains and technologies, particularly in the cyber and space domains. These activities not only challenge a stable and open international system, but also regional democratic institutions, the rule of law and the sovereignty of this hemisphere's nations. Moreover, events in the Western Hemisphere affect our homeland's security and prosperity. They are uh, transcendent of, of our national borders. So I'll stop there uh, in terms of opening thoughts and looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you, Secretary. Admiral Fowler, would you like to continue your opening remarks? Thank you. Great rundown, Melissa, and, and good to see you. But to follow up on that, this, this hemisphere is our neighborhood. And we have to think of it that way and treat it that way and think about what good neighbors mean to each other and what constitutes a good neighborhood. Proximity is very important. Distance does matter. A people, the cultural affinity we have, the, the, the heritage we share. Um, my wife is of Brazilian heritage, just for example. That, that's so important. The resources. We often think and hear about lithium and fish, but water and the human resources. This hemisphere has 30% of the world's water and discounting the United States and Canada and Mexico, the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean have about 8% of the world's population. And, and that plethora of water is attractive for agricultural, for transportation and other, other key commodities. The hemisphere is uniquely positioned for its access to space and and cyber and this crossroads of numerous key choke points, the Panama Canal and the Strait of Magellan, the Drake Passage at the southern portion of the hemisphere. And, and we have to foster a more understanding of that importance and its value to global security. This is not just a US national security issue, it's a global security issue. And I think that appreciation uh, has to come forward even more prominently in our strategic documents. China certainly recognizes that. They have invested, as was laid out at the opening by Jessica and Guido, um, they've invested a lot in their Global Belt and Road Initiative, which is coming up on its 10th anniversary. And many of their activities, the reason why the term gray is so appropriate, uh, are legitimate or are masked as legitimate with uh, entrapments attached. I'll, I'll cite a few examples. At the height of COVID, as we were all searching uh, for how to respond here at home and what the resources were, the global simile reeling in our partners uh, had an even bigger challenges to face, particularly in, in the hemisphere. Uh, we never stopped traveling. Uh, it maybe took a month off, but we quickly realized we have to get down there and sit down with our partners at you know, appropriately distanced, whatever, but look them in the eye and see what they need. And the needs were desperate. Uh, the US was responding. We weren't making a lot of fanfare about it. And sometimes we were not talking enough about what our global response was, uh, but we were responding. And so was China. I would show up and we have some significant authorities that Secretary Dalton helps uh, minister for humanitarian assistance and disaster response. I'd show up with, with uh, some very modest means, but a little goes a long way when people are desperate. And invariably the same day or the day before the Chinese would show up with a, a, a very well branded jet uh, and, and more things than we were bringing. It, no coincidence, they were tracking our movements and they were looking to outcompete us right here in our neighborhood. Much of this was legitimate and when you're desperate, I'm not gonna go in there and I'm gonna, I should help welcome all assistance and I did. But there were gray zone strings attached in many cases. And there were countries that weren't getting needed assistance because they weren't willing to submit to the demands that were being placed on them from China. In, for, for example, one country, uh, if you shift your, from Taiwan to us as a recognition, we'll supply you all the vaccines you need. That's the kind of underlying, I mean, I, I think that transcends gray zone into illegal, illicit, any kind of negative words you wanna add. Uh, but it's it's mass and it's not all bad. It's hard, you can't just shout China bad. We have to understand, as Secretary Dalton said, the complexity associated. Take cyber. There's an often cited statistic and it changes somewhat, but uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 43 of the top most violent cities in the world are resident in this hemisphere. So countries are desperate for 
and need solutions, holistic solutions, to get after that, that crime. Uh, and undermining that, since corruption is also a fuel of instability in this hemisphere and globally, uh, it's hard to come up with sustainable judicial systems. So surveillance becomes an attractive option. Anyone who's been to Beijing knows that the PRC has created the most holistic, horrific, comprehensive surveillance state in the history of the world. I mean, you can't have a light post without multiple sensors inter integrated uh, that uh, track and, and are compulated. Well, they're importing that system. And, and you can't compete with the import because it's state-owned or state-supported businesses that undercut usually in sole source contracts. So what you see in all cities around the hemisphere, 24 of 31 countries have some solution set and half of them have the smart city, safe city program. It's a plethora of surveillance systems which are by law all reporting right back to China. Ambassador after ambassador would take me to the window of the US embassy and say, look at that lamppost out there. See those cameras? That's Chinese kit. This is the safest section of the city, <laughs> Admiral Fowler. Why do our five cameras pointed at the street and the U.S. Embassy? That's gray zone activity. The final story, the one minister of defense who'd gone to our schools. You know, our best counter is, is being ourselves. Professional, outgoing, committed, uh, democratic, peace-loving people. Uh, they, they like like everywhere, like to go to U.S. schools. And, and he cleared the meeting room, just me and him, and he said, look, you, you come here, it's great, but you're, anything we ask for takes two, three, four years, or there'll be a new national defense bill that cancels the program because we have a new president, and what they're saying is not consistent with democracy, but our institution is professional. And he started getting tears in his eyes. I'm being pressured to accept X, Y, and Z from the PRC, from the PLA. And uh, I'm going to have to start accepting uh, security cooperation assistance. Bring me something. So the best counter to all this, and the other takeaway, the main takeaway today is we've got to spend time talking about the complexities of the challenge. The, the best counter is to be the best athlete on the field, to quote a sports analogy. Uh, Celtics are going to take game five tonight. I, I guarantee part of their game plan is not going to be is not going to be out there saying we we're going to block our own shots. Yet I often felt as a combatant commander that one hand in the U.S. government was blocking the shots of the other hand with countervailing policies that were not conducive to what we put in our own strategic documents, which are being to be a good partner. And my father, a great opening. And there's a few things that as we evolve the conversation, I'm going to want to pull on some threads. One is the balance between competition and the needs of our partner and the symbiosis between the two. And the second one is that blocking shots and or coordinating and collaborating with the interagency. So we'll touch on that. In the meantime, I'll hand it over to, to Ryan here for your opening remarks. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Guido, for, for having me up. It's a pleasure to be here on this panel with Admiral Fowler and with Assistant Secretary Dalton. There's a lot of CSIS on this on this panel, so we're former CSIS, um, and uh, you've put me in the unenviable position of having to go last. Um, so I I don't want to belabor the point, but I think that the opening thing that I want to say is you know we're talking about gray zone activity today. It's a capacious category of things that we're talking about. Anything from uh, dual use technologies to actual cyber. Uh, active cyber measures to IUU phishing. I mean, the, the, the scope of things that we're discussing today is just so uh, immeasurable that it's going to be impossible to address all of it um, in, in an hour and a half. But uh, suffice to say that it, having observed the PRC in our hemisphere for a long time, um, it's all part of an integrated strategy for them. It, it really seems to be uh, that way. Um, when we talk about PRC gray zone activity. Um, so again, it could be IUU phishing, could be cyber, could be the safe city stuff that the, that the Admiral uh, uh, mentioned because you've got all the technology uh, gadgets that go with it. It could be through the proliferation of untrusted vendors in the ICT sector, right? That's another thing that we've seen, apart from all the, the cameras, right? The, the presence of Huawei and, and ZTE and other companies that we, we consider highly untrustworthy vendors. Um, who, by virtue of Chinese domestic law, have to report back to, to the party structure involved in building out ICT infrastructure in the hemisphere. Uh, it could be all of these things. Um, 
I want to touch uh, just for a second on what I think is, is at stake when we're talking about this to kind of set the scene. Um, as the Admiral said, and as Assistant Secretary Dalton said as well, no other region of the world is more important for our shared prosperity, our shared security, um, uh, the economic integration of, of the United States. And for whatever reason, you know, I've been working the Latin America portfolio in DC for a long time. Sometimes that argument doesn't find fertile soil. <laughs> uh, it's an obvious one to make because when you say it, people look at you and they're like, well, yeah, duh, these are our neighbors. This is our shared neighborhood. But then when you're translating into policy, sometimes it doesn't seem to, to sort of get to that level where we have the fully strategic uh, kind of level of, of, of thinking. Um, this is a tangible vector, the, the Western Hemisphere, for security threats to enter the United States. So I can't put it in any more stark terms than, than that as to why we should, why we should care about it. Um, and the last thing that I think is at stake here, most, most importantly, is actually democracy. Uh, this is a hemisphere mostly of, of democracies, right? We've got 35 countries, including the US, in the hemisphere, um, 32 of which still at this moment, depending upon how you categorize El Salvador, Bolivia, a couple other hybrid regimes, but let's say 32 are democracies, right? Show me another region of the world that's as democratic as, as the one that, that, that we call home, right? So democracy is, is really at stake when um, when all of this gray zone activity is going on, as well as uh, the PRC becoming the number one trading partner of a significant number of countries in the hemisphere, you have shifts that take place. There's a, there's a complex interplay between the endogenous um, impacts on a country and what happens domestically with the exogenous, right? And so we're doing some work at CSIS looking at um, democratic backsliding and the causal role that China's rise as the number one trading partner since economic engagement is the largest piece of this, the role that that might have to play in democratic backsliding in the region. But I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that democracy itself is at stake when we're talking about PRC activity in, in the hemisphere. Ryan, good, good opening. I think you brought up something I think I've heard it a couple times. We've talked BRI, you know, Belt Road Initiative. You brought up the init other initiatives they may have. Uh, so this first question I'm gonna direct to you, but feel free, uh, Admiral Fowler and Assistant Secretary Dalton to chime in. Uh, after Ryan goes, but really it's related to the three initiatives that the PRC leverages, right? So their indirect, their indirect approach is guided by their, those three main initiatives, Belt and Road Initiative, Global Defense Initiative, Global Security Initiative, and I would even venture to say that their civil military fusion plays a critical role in that as well, as we talk to state-owned enterprises and things of that nature. Uh, how are you seeing the PRC implement these initiatives in the context of the gray zone? And can you draw parallels between what we see in the Western Hemisphere and what we're seeing in other regions of the world? So there's a lot to unpack uh, there, there, Guido. But the, um, on the BRI piece, you mentioned in your opening statement, we've got 21 of the, the 35 countries in the Western Hemisphere part of the BRI. Let's subtract the US and Canada and assume that they're not about to join the BRI anytime soon. You've got 33 countries. You've got seven countries in the hemisphere still that recognize Taiwan. Right, so that puts you down into the mid 20s. 21 of those countries are already in the BRI, right? So you've basically got almost the entire hemisphere um, part that is eligible to be part of the, BR, the BRI, part of the BRI, right? Notable um, outlying outstanding countries like Brazil still haven't joined, but that hasn't stopped the PRC from being the largest source of FDI in Brazil in 2021, for example, right? Um, so you have a level of investment that I think over the coming years, we're going to see the PRC behaving in ways very similar to the ways that they behave in other parts of the world. I don't think that there's any distinct, uh, distinctness about Latin America and the Caribbean. There's no reason we should fundamentally say this region is different, the Chinese are going to behave differently here than they behave in, say, Southeast Asia or in Africa or in other places we, we have observed them. And so what does that mean? It means after a certain number of years of building up economic relations with countries, uh, usually the coercion piece comes into play, right? That the Chinese will expect uh, countries to defer to their interests, to understand uh, their interests, and to use economic coercion or leverage um, to be able to have countries take into account their interests and, and in fact, even crimp their own policy of autonomy um, when it comes to, to showing that, that, that deference. On the global security piece, um, I think one thing that we've seen 
uh, the Chinese do in, in recent years, which is notable, given that the admiral is sitting right next to me and Southcom is still the first call for many countries in, in the region. It's because of the great work that, that the COCOM does. Um, but one area where I think the Chinese have noticed uh, they can make some inroads is in the, the policing area, right? Uh, we've seen them do this in other parts of the world, like in the Solomon Islands, signing agreements that allow them to, to have sort of exclusive access to some of the policing arrangements in the country and maybe using that as a way to kick the door ajar for greater defense cooperation. Um, and I think we've seen it in, in the hemisphere as well, a number of training programs, um, a number of equipment sharing uh, programs. And as the Admiral mentioned in his opening remarks, as long as the region represents a disproportional amount of global homicides, right? Latin America and the Caribbean is 8% of the global population. It represents in any given year anywhere between 30 and 33% of global homicides, right? It's punching above its weight in categories it doesn't want to be in. So as long as it's overrepresented in the homicides category, there's going to be that incentive there to participate on things that um, on a domestic level look like it brings greater control, or greater, um, uh, greater policing function, greater capacity building, and fewer homicides. Um, that's something that leaders are going to be very attracted to, right? They're going to want to participate in those programs. Um, so we have to be very careful, and we have to keep a very close eye on, on some of those things. I think the Chinese are smart with what they do with the Global Security Initiative and some of the police cooperation partnerships they've advanced in recent years. They have, they have a playbook, and their playbook uh, is unfolding globally. So it's not limited to Africa or their near abroad or Latin America. Their playbook involves engaging at the local level, mayors, local officials, uh, establishing relationships. This uh, rampant violence, uh, not an enviable statistic in the hemisphere, is undermined by a lack of, tr lack of rule of law, and a weak judicial systems. And that's an area that's long been US focus. It takes time. And, and corruption. And so I mentioned corruption at the outset. It fuels uh, a lot of the Chinese, the PRC, and I'll distinguish that from China, the PRC's playbook. So going in, working local officials at the business level, the mayor level, allows China access, allows the PRC access and their state-owned enterprises or state influence enterprises, which encompasses all their, their commercial entities, uh, generally an opportunity to come in and sole source, no source, no bid uh, on a contract. And I hosted a roundtable in Panama along with my deputy commander of business leaders. So these would be regional directors, presidents of US businesses operating in Latin America and the Caribbean, covered ports to energy to paper products and computers. I didn't preference, just wanted to get smarter on the economic dimension of security. I didn't bias the discussion with any read aheads or any effort to steer the conversation in China. In fact, I provided very little in opening remarks and I asked each one of them to, to voice their concerns. Number one concern, the ability to compete fairly for business versus Chinese companies, which have gotten an inroad utilizing corruption or single source methods and lack of transparency, uh, who grab contracts that often made no financial or no sense to a country's prioritization, but were lining uh, corrupted officials' pockets. This is part of their playbook, and it's part of this gray zone activity. Is the Don, would you like to say a couple of comments about that? Yeah, just to, to build upon um, the, the great comments made so far, um, you know, the PRC is able to bring together scale, speed, and impact of economic and technological investment and change, and they wrap it all in um, highly effective campaign and diplomatic messaging um, that, that is really hard to, to compete with, um, particularly in a region where, you know, as Ryan was speaking to a bit earlier, um, there are other parts of the world, arguably, where the United States is, is more invest, invested, more in, engaged in. Um, but we also see that the PRC uh, is suffering from certain disadvantages observed um, in other regions as well, to Craig's point on um, they have a playbook, um, it also actually comes with some downsides for them. 
um, whether that's poor project execution, uh, many of their report and infrastructure projects stall out or um, are rendered uh, to not yield economic benefit uh, for, for partners after a few years. Um, and there is at times a fundamental uh, PRC lack of understanding of um, the democracies in, in this region and their influence on bilateral and multilateral relations. Um, so there, there could be some opportunity there, um, you know, maybe for us to, to loop back to as we move along in our dis discussion in terms of the information domain and how to expose and highlight um, some of these disadvantages. Um, just to hit on a couple of more points, I think, um, you know, to your question in, in terms of um, other trend lines we see around the world, um, a lot of similarities, I think, here with um, the African continent um, to what we see in Latin America and in the Caribbean when it comes to dual use ports, space facilities, critical mineral extraction, and illegal fishing. Um, for example, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are at least 17 deep water ports owned or operated by some of the same PRC state owned enterprises in Africa. Uh, many of those are located around important sea lines of communication like the Panama Canal, the Strait of Magellan and the Caribbean Basin. Um, and even if the People's Liberation Army does not overtly use these ports for military purposes, it can certainly use them for intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. Another example is space uh, facilities. In the Western Hemisphere, China has 11 space research ground stations in South America, including Espacio Lejano Station in Argentina, which was built by a subsidiary of the PLA Strategic Support Force. Um, and while the PRC and Argentine authorities have said the station is being used for civilian space research, many of the sites have the capability to be dual use military sites. Um, so on balance, I think it poses the question of what is the PRC's intent um, in, in the hemisphere? Are they building um, access and influence uh, for a, a long game here? Um, you know, and, and what um, is, is the potential military intent uh, for some of these facilities? Thank you, ma'am. I think, so we, we've now identified some of the, the complexities and, and um, activities in the Western Hemisphere. I think now it'd be good to transition and first start with you, Assistant Secretary, on what are we doing about it from a Department of Defense perspective, especially since uh, the majority of these activities seem to be centered around economics uh, as a center of gravity. How does the military dimension support uh, countering or deterring some of these activities from the People's Republic of China? Absolutely. So, you know, again, our starting point here is the 2022 National Defense Strategy and the, the overall frame and line of effort um, that, that that charts out comes to our strategic focus on the PRC and um, how we go about um, competing in, in gray zone operations. And then uh, as we've already unpacked here, the, the complexity of how that plays out in, in this hemisphere. Um, as President Biden has said, democracy is the hallmark of the Americas, um, and we believe that the entire Western Hemisphere can be secure, prosperous, and democratic. Um, the countries in the region aren't just bound together by geography. We're also dr drawn closer by our common interests and our common values, and our deep respect for human rights, human dignity, our commitment to the rule of law, and our devotion to democracy. When it comes to the tools that the department has, uh, we advance our goals through three primary ways, integrated deterrence, campaigning, and actions that build enduring advantage. One of our enduring advantages in the region is the network of mutually beneficial alliances and partnerships that we have stitched together around the globe, including in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this is an enduring strength uh, and really a center of gravity for the United States and it's critical for us to be able to achieve our objectives as a unified response to Russia's further invasion of Ukraine has, has certainly demonstrated. Our alliances and partnerships play a key role in integrated de deterrence, which entails developing and combining our strengths to maximum effect. We do this by working seamlessly across warfighting domains, across theaters, the spectrum of conflict to include the gray zone, and with other instruments of US national power. 
Guido, this gets to your point in terms of um, the economic dimension, the technological dimension, um, you know, all the various uh, fronts in which we find ourselves in this competition, being able to work uh, across whole of government um, with the private sector um, to common purpose is, is quite critical here. Um, and from a DOD perspective, of course, this is all backed up um, by our combat credible forces um, and uh, the way that we engage with our partners in the region through security cooperation, through defense institution building um, and enabling partner operations. We have uh, deep uh, partnerships throughout the region, just celebrated 200 years of diplomatic relations with Colombia. Uh, same with Mexico, um, and uh, this is truly a, a critical asset for us. The, uh, those words are backed by substance. It was an honor to be the commander of Southcom and sit down with a partner and, and listen, vice lecture, and get to understand what their concerns were and get an appreciation for the the appreciation they had for the U.S. military, for Southern Command, for our capabilities, and importantly, our professionalism. So I'd take the, the, those words out of the 2022 National Defense Strategy that Secretary Dalton framed and, and convert that to professionalism. So the focus for the Department of Defense and Southcom, and, and we'll get to some areas we can improve. There's plenty of them, but, but it's there's a lot of goodness going on day in, day out. And the focus is building strong professional institutions because those are what are built to last. And if the institution's values are aligned like our own, sure, we'll make some missteps along the way, but our North Star will stay true to the, those value-based principles that Secretary Dalton laid out, human rights. Brand, advancement of equal opportunity for you know, the best professional to rise in your ranks. Uh, embracing women's peace and security programs. These are just not hollow words. These are things we work on hard and every day, uh, hard on every day, and we believe are important part of professionalism and combat readiness. Our partners share those same views. Jointness. Uh, I had to smile a little bit, Melissa, seamlessly across all our departments. There, we we want to work seamlessly. There are some areas where we could stitch the seams up a bit, but we do a good job of jointness, which is and we've got a number of of fellows here. Space Force, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, uh, Special Forces, Army, all working together as a joint force, and we do a good job at interagency. In, in the course of my, my time in the U.S. military, I had a tour at Indo-PACOM, had two tours at CENTCOM and one at SOUTHCOM. And, and in our U.S. embassies, th those are studies in interagency integration, and we do bring holistic solutions that are integrated to help our partners. Uh, this is playing out, and it's it's the best way to meet, in my view, to meet the complexity of the security challenges posed by uh, this competition, this existential competition. I might add, Ryan, I completely agree that democracy is at stake here with the competition that's going on. That was why the, the, the National Defense Strategy, these documents are so liberating and so important. The uh, 2018 National Defense Strategy set the table and allowed us, the professionals, the teams, and all the departments to begin talking about China as a competitor in, 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 in a different way that was helpful to building resilience and building programs that mattered uh, so that we can integrate deterrence and never, never fight, which would be the goal here. Thanks. Staying on the same vein of our national defense strategy and employment of forces within DOD is that military dimension. My question is, as, as you know, special operations have played a critical role uh, from the Cold War on uh, in competition, essentially. And they're purpose-built. They provide asymmetric options. They're culturally astute, usually speak the local languages, and build enduring relationships over decades uh, at times. Uh, however, you know, as we've evolved into strategic competition. Many have called into question, what is special operations role in competition uh, outside of the global war on terror? Um, so my question is, what do you think SOF's role is? And specifically, uh, Admiral Fowler, to you first, um, I want to talk about three pieces of it. Really, of course, the, the natural one is the build part, building partner capacity. I think that's just um, institutionalized within specifically special forces, uh, intelligence, Irregular warfare, which I will define. Uh, and then, of course, as we talk about those seams, 
Uh, recently, there's been a lot of discussions about a, a soft space cyber triad to counter some of these activities. But before answering the question for the audience and for everyone else, I do want to read the definition of regular warfare. He likes to beat us up if we don't explain these things to the, to the broader audience. So it's a struggle among state and non-state actors to influence populations and affect legitimacy. It favors indirect and asymmetric approaches, though it may employ the full spectrum of military and other capabilities in order to erode the adversary's power, influence, and will. Over to you, Admiral. I'm, I hope, hopefully I smile a lot, but I'm especially smiling at this since uh, uh, Mr. Torres Guido, as a fellow here, comes from U.S. Special Operations Forces. So, <laughs> and I don't want to uh, dominate the airtime here. Uh, it, it's an important element, our Special Operations Forces, and they have very highly specialized skills. Uh, and they're very good at engaging fellow soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen at all levels. That's what they've built their careers on is small team engagement. And the high standards that our forces have demonstrated in professionalism and skills are, are ones that, are, that our partners want to emulate. And so there's, a, there's an absolute engagement opportunity here. There, happens, there also happens to be a real threat and a fight going on in the number my colleagues have mentioned is transnational criminal organizations, a number of which are characterized as terrorist organizations, particularly Colombia and elsewhere. Our special operations forces are in an advisor role to help um, our partners uh, increase their ca capacity and capability to take on this fight. But that's just one piece of our joint force. I, I know we have other members of the joint force here as fellows in the audience. It, uh, our partners want to be with us, partner, learn from us, and we have a lot to learn from them in, in, in some many respects. Uh, you, you go to a country like Brazil, you go to their space center, uh, this is this world class. There's a lot to be learned from listening, uh, vice lecturing, and really engaging on an aspect of mutual respect from our partners. And I know our soft come away with that when they're, when they're out there working in the field. Ryan, I'm back to you here. You probably have a lot to say about the last oh, question. No, no. I was just pointing to, to Guido because I wanted to signal that I wanted to, to jump in brief, just very briefly on the partnerships angle. Because there was a question earlier about what, what we're doing. And I think we have tons of examples of great partnerships across the hemisphere. Uh, just last week, I was in um, Costa Rica, where it was the 10th anniversary of a program that we call US CAP, right? So we've invested about $13 billion in Colombia through Plan Colombia, a bipartisan action plan to build up uh, a number of capacities in, in, that, in that country. And the question about 10 years ago was, how do we take uh, the Colombian forces that we've spent so much time training and building up to be providers of security in their country. And since they know the culture, they speak the language, they understand the region, in some cases much better than even we do, let's send them out. Let's have them train uh, their partner, their partners in the region. So they've started training with police forces and with other, with other armed forces in, in the region. It was the 10th anniversary of, of that program, which you know, we were there for two days talking about the successes of it, um, and it, it was a very interesting, you know, moment and time of reflection where um, everybody was quite thankful to have had had the opportunity to partake in this in this program. I think it's a perfect example of a of a of a program that was that was well put together, well funded, well thought through about how to to take this historic investment that we made in Colombia over the years and make it beneficial for the rest of the region. Um, as an exemplar. The other thing I would say that we do really well is meeting partners where they're at in the defense space. I think we need to do a better job of meeting partners where they're at in the economic needs and the development needs space. That's sort of outside of this, this conversation. Meeting partners where they're at in the, in the defense space, uh, I think we do a really, really great job of that. I'll point out a great paper that the Admiral just uh, published recently at the Atlantic Council on uh, HADR efforts, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. Um, with another fellow named Pat Patterson. Um, it's a great, a great piece on everything that Southcom does in terms of uh, disaster relief and, and assistance in the hemisphere. Southcom is the first call for most of our partners in, in the region when, when something bad happens that's natural disaster related. It's a great example of how we meet partners where they're at with their needs in the moment. Thank you for that. You know, exactly right. And it's an interagency effort. Often the military with its unique capabilities 
can respond the fastest. Assistant Secretary, I'd like to, uh, for you to chime in on that same question, if you can, please. Sure. Um, so software, of course, special. Uh, <laughs> they provide uh, unique uh, roles and authorities uh, in, in the hemisphere um, related to, to partnering and, and also certainly when it comes to, to strategic competition um, <laughs> through building partnership capacity through what we call the Section 333 authority. Um, they advise and assist uh, capacities with select partner forces uh, to help build their capabilities um, in areas such as border and maritime security. Civil affairs teams uh, also provide critically needed assistance, often in support of broader US government or embassy efforts to enable, as uh, Craig was mentioning, um, the humanitarian angle, also educational and other forms of, of assistance to, to key partners. And SOF also provide unique capabilities enabling multi-domain uh, awareness in areas where competitors like the PRC are uh, conducting gray zone operations that can encroach upon partner sovereignty. Um, and uh, that's probably all that I could say on, on that score, uh, but a really important and unique capability set um, that, that certainly um, Southcom stewards in the region. Thank you. So we're going to shift a little uh, now, talking more about how we're seeing some changes in the hemisphere and what that means in competition. So, Ryan, really, this question is for you to begin here. You know, how do you see our positional advantage in the Western Hemisphere, especially as we're seeing a resurgence of leftist and authoritarian regimes uh, prop up that may be more keen to working with the PRC and less with us, especially as our um, national priorities, um, you know, to speak to to just the way we do business is anti-corruption, uh, anti-democratic uh, institutions, things of that, that nature. So as we're seeing these authoritarian or leftist regimes rise, what do you think that's going to do to competition between the U.S. and, and the PRC? Well, um, I know that there's this notion that sort of nationalist, populist, leftist regimes are, are more willing to, to work with China. That might be true, but it's not always borne out in, in the evidence. For example, um, I spent a lot of time looking at a country like Brazil. Very few people who look at Brazil and, and Washington. Um, and we thought we had an opportunity with Jair Bolsonaro to really get in there and um, uh, wrestle with the PRC for some of, of, of China's you know, immense um, influence in, in Brazil. And even under a right-wing president, uh, Brazil increased its trade with, with China, increased its cooperation. With China, even on some of the, the major issues, such as Huawei, I mean, we had Brazil on the cusp of agreeing to prevent Huawei to be part of its 5G spectrum auction. And to the Admiral's point, uh, it was in the middle of COVID. Brazil was in its second deep spike of, of COVID. The, the uh, country's health system was on the verge of, of collapse. And the PRC came knocking with, uh, with vaccines. And uh, unfortunately, they reversed a, a bit of the decision on, on Huawei and allowing it back into the 5G auction, the 5G spectrum auction. So I, I, I do see that there's maybe slightly more um, you know, willingness to engage with, with the PRC, with some of the leftist governments in the region. But I don't think it's borne out uniformly. Right? I, I think we, we need to, and, and frankly, when I say that, it's humbling, right? Because it means that it's not, a, it's not necessarily a, um, a political type or an ideology question. It's more a question of how do we partner and be, be the preferred partner, be the better partner that's actually meeting um, our friends' needs, as opposed to let's hope that the domestic politics of XYZ country delivers this guy or this gal because they're less likely to engage with, with the PRC. Um, and so I think that part of it is just determining those areas where we can ask our, our partners to limit their cooperation with the PRC and then hope that we can offer a better alternative. And then knowing those areas that where perhaps there's not as much gray zone uh, potential that we decide you know, the PRC is, is their activity can continue forward and we're just going to work with partner countries to sort of insulate them from some of the corrosive effects, potentially, of, of that engagement. That's how I would look at it, as opposed to uh, from the political angle of leftist versus rightist uh, regimes. I, I think that speaks to also what we're seeing a lot now in the news, specifically with 
support uh, for Ukraine or, or no support to Russia, the non-alignment piece that, keep, that <laughs> continues to come up, right? And it's just a balance. How do we balance that? Going back to your, your opening comments, Admiral Fowler, how do we balance competition with the needs of our partners, whether that's security needs of our partner uh, or whether that's economic or in your time, COVID uh, uh, support, vaccine support. How do you balance and reconcile those two things, especially as we talk resources? Sometimes when you submit for your resources, they have to be aligned with the priority of the department. So how do you reconcile? It may not look like strategic competition, but it is competition because we need to be there for our partners. Right. We, we've to repeat the sports analogy, you've got to be on the field to compete, but you also have to suit up and you have to bring your game and you have to deliver something to a partnership. It's, it's two-way, right? I think of a partnership handshake. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm feeling that it's a two-way uh, and the partners have to deliver to us. But we can't make it binary yes, no to China. It's not, it's not a credible situation to name your country, to sit down with them and start with their relationship with PRC that's not even in the room, uh, they'll simply remind the U.S. that they're the number one trading partner for the U.S. and they're the country that we're talking to in general, their number one trading partner. So it was said at the outset by each of my colleagues here that this is really complicated and it's complex. And so we have to really understand what aspects of that PRC relationship with our partner might be might run counter to what we believe are global norms or U.S. interests, and then we have to decide whether we take it head on or we can work with it. And often we have to share what we think we understand with our partner. Uh, I started tried to start to do something where we go to a country before I go. I said I want to take something if we think and believe that there are gray zone activities uh, that are not counter to our partner, name your country, that we're about to go visit um, own national security. Let's put that in a placemat or some kind of product where we can share it with them. Do they know? What level of understanding do they have? And often it was so encumbered with our own uh, cross interagency sharing regimes that at the end of the day, it would look like I put a dot on a napkin and hand it to the partner, even though we knew there was some real serious concerns with activities going on. So as part of this effort, we've got to, we've got to walk the talk on information sharing and opening up and transparency on what we know and why we know it uh, that the partner might not know because there, there's not any incentive for sharing within their own departments. And that kind of comes at the end of a conversation. But this gets back to some fundamental agreements that we can get in place with partner nations and other mechanisms that there is more work that we can do to help what I think is an eroding positional advantage. Thanks. All right, so and we talked about it a little bit today when we talk about those themes we may have, not just in the joint force, but really within the whole of government. And obviously from our national defense strategy the slogan, integrated deterrence, that's a whole of government, interagency, partners, all domains. Um, during the global war on terror, we developed several joint interagency task forces. Obviously Southcom has joint interagency, uh, Jayat of South that handles the counter narcotics uh, piece. Um, and a, a myriad of fusion centers that brought in all the elements of national power on a coordinated effort to uh, either counter or deter threat. Do you see a potential, and I guess I'll first uh, kick this one over to uh, Secretary Dalton. Do you see a potential for establishing maybe regional uh, joint interagency task forces uh, to just harness and convene the rest of the elements of national power to counter and deter some of these threats, specifically gray zone threats because of the big economic aspect and information aspects of it and a small military dimension where we can actually bring resources and contribute exponentially to those efforts. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, look, the, this region is um, certainly benefited from such uh, structures um, in the past and, and currently. If you look at um, the Giant F uh, South model um, to, to get after, um, you know, the, the counter drug uh, challenge set. Um, I think what 
could be different about this uh, particular dimension is um, the, the, as we've been talking about throughout a light motif of our discussion, if you will, is, is the complexity of how in particular countries or even particular localities in countries um, that competition is, is manifesting. Um, and so while I think, you know, the, the playbook itself is global um, and there are certainly regional dimensions to this that transcend boundaries, the, the solutions might be highly local. Um, and so I think in some ways there may be um, a, a really important conversation to be had about um, do we have the right structures and approaches to be able to look at this challenge set and then define the solutions and tools and alignment of authorities that are needed um, to be able to operate trans-regionally, but also country-specific and then getting locality-specific. Um, and you know how that lines up against how the U.S. government is structured, um, how our authorities are, are structured. Um, you know, I think th there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that regard. One thing we are doing just to share, um, you know, with, within the department and working with the, in the interagency with, and with partners is um, following the issuance of, of the 2022 NDS. Um, we set up two working groups, um, one focused on uh, defense opportunities, um, to, to try to get after what Craig was talking about in terms of some of the perennial um, roadblocks that we experience when it comes to getting our security cooperation out the door more expeditiously. <laughs> Um, that I think, um, while still a lot of work uh, to go, has been quite fruitful in, in starting to identify ways uh, to remove some of those impediments or get some interagency traction on them um, in, in certain cases. The other working group we've, we've established is um, looking at campaigning uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, you know, I think some folks uh, think about integrated turns, think about campaigning, and wonder what does that actually mean in practice. Um, and so, uh, the, the mandate for that working group is to chart out specific outcomes and objectives uh, for campaigning in this region that um, could resonate in specific countries and, and localities, and then looking at what is the best alignment of authorities and tools um, to, to um, pursue those lines of effort. So don't pretend to have all the answers here, certainly at the Department of Defense, um, but to uh, frame out um, you know, part of the approach that at least we're taking. Thank you. Just my comment on that. I think that um, as an operator in the Navy for many years, intelligence and information drives everything. So the more we can understand and know about an adversary, an event, a problem, some of it's intelligence because it falls in certain categories where we have to classify and protect it. Some is just information that we need to get our arms around. And then it starts, as Melissa said, it, it depends. It's local. It's what is the relationship with a certain country? Do we have an agreement in place? Can we share intelligence? Have they, are they, there's a process that you go through to certify an intelligence sharing relationship. And then what would their, their report, uh, as Ryan particularly stated, this is a democratic hemisphere. They report to political leaders. They get a vote in what they share as security professionals. We have to work through that. And then is there opportunities for multilateral sharing? Again, they, they are democracies. We have to respect their choice in that matter and what they share. And so you know, one area of complete agreement is the corrosive effect of transnational criminal organizations. There you have in Key West uh, well over 20 countries with lots of bilateral and multilateral agreements in place that share a lot of intelligence that are getting after a threat significantly. And the partners have stepped up significantly in the percentage that they offer in that space. Can that model be replicated? An um, in initiative started by South Southern Command at Florida International University, rather than start something brick and mortar, which costs a lot of money, comes with a big tail, can we get an academic institution to create a virtual research hub platform as an information gathering safe space where partners can come in, and, and it's very nascent, but the Security Research Hub at Florida International uh, University offers the type of opportunity and innovative kind of mechanisms to bring people together to share information and help solve problems. 
Admiral, Admiral, I think what Southcom's done with bridging the gap with Florida International University and Southern Command has been it's been great just because of the simple fact that you can harness not just the government side, but the academia side, and be able to inform not only the U.S. population, but also our partners in, in the hemisphere. But I guess my question is to Ryan on this, because we, we've talked about integrated deterrence and bringing all these elements together. I think sometimes what we don't discuss is academia and the private sector. Um, so what role do you see can the civil society, the private sector, and academia, even the media playing um, to counter China's influence, to include some of their disinformation, misinformation campaigns, but also in advancing democratic norms and values in the region? Well, thanks, Gita. That's a, an excellent uh, question. And um, I think part of, part of it is gonna be a self-interested answer, right? I work in an organization that puts out research that wants to have policy impact. So I think we should see a proliferation of that across the region. Um, and that's the academic, you know, scholarly part part of the piece. Um, I think civil society is is really is is key here, and I I, I emphasize or re-emphasize the democratic uh, nature of of the region uh, to remind folks that there's in many countries really robust civil society, um, even in the countries that we consider to be dictatorships. Look at Venezuela, for example, right? There's a pretty robust civil society in Venezuela, right? There are people who are fighting back. Um, and doing remarkable things to sort of track the regime and, and, and hold it to account for things like political prisoners, for things like corruption, for the operations of criminal organizations with which it's in bed, all sorts of things like that. There's a robust civil society, even in the countries that have hollowed or tried to hollow it out. Um, and that should be seen as an ally for the United States in combating China's PRC efforts, mostly in the information sharing space. So if China has a strategy that involves winning concessional or, or winning contracts for development-oriented projects um, with large amounts of corruption, well, given that this is a democratic region, people are going to be upset about that, right? So if you can find ways to publicize that information, right, you can bring it then into the public sphere where it becomes a political issue where the person who took the, the kickback uh, to, to kick the contract over to the PRC will then have to publicly account for that, uh, for that behavior, right? The media and civil society is, is our ally in, in that effort to shed light on some of these practices, to shed light on the scope and, and scale of illegal, unregulated, uh, and unreported fishing in the hemisphere, right? Uh, you've got small fishing communities in countries like Ecuador, for example, that are devastated by this activity but they don't understand the full uh, nature of what China is up to with its 300 plus per uh, ship fleet um, hanging out around the Galapagos, right? So you gotta find ways to use the local media space to, to get that narrative out there so people are in the know about it and then you can have the democratic processes in many of these countries start working, right? Demanding accountability, demanding that leaders step up and do something about it. Um, that's an, a perfect example of the way where we can have partner democracies do some of the work that we would otherwise tend to think we have to do ourselves, right? We don't have to do everything, um, but we can a lot of times just help set democratic processes in motion by using things like civil society and media. And la lastly, on the, on the media front, um, China has a, a robust presence um, in media. We haven't really talked much about media today. But they have a, a presence in, in media in the region. It's generally considered to be less concerning than Russia's uh, um, operations, media operations in, in the region. But it still gets the message out there. And, and it, it's, it's pernicious, uh, I would say, and, and deleterious to democracy in a couple ways. First is that it, um, it generally tends to favor what, what the Chinese call the right to development. And they're spinning this narrative of, of the right to development, which prioritizes the state and the rights of the state and the collective over the individual and private enterprise, right? So now you're starting to talk about different types of development models that don't necessarily fit with the types of political models that we have in, in the region. I'm not saying that China's pushing a model. I'm saying that they're pushing a narrative that could lead to And it brings the focus away from, from the individual, from individual liberties, from, from democracy. The second thing that they're pushing very hard, and we've seen this plainly in Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, is the language about a multipolar order, 
a lot of countries buying into, into the language of a multipolar order. It's already arrived. It's already here. It's not something we're looking at in the future. It's something that we have uh, in, in the here and now. And we should welcome it. Not just that it exists, but that we should welcome it. The Chinese have been pushing that very, very, very hard. Um, and they message all of the right things. You know, they message cooperation. They message South-South relations. Cooperation is probably the word that they use most often um, in, in a lot of their public language. Win-win. Win-win. You know? win. Uh, it, it's, it's a set of things that sound sort of very, um, very anodyne. But actually, when you peel back a couple layers of the onion, there's a lot more there there that's concerning. A quick story to highlight um, Ryan's excellent point about the media. We're in Guyana for one of the first uh, visits of a Southcom commander in a while. There's a new presidential regime. They've pledged to work on corruption, good governance, all the right thing. Also happens to be the fastest growing GDP in the, in the, in the world with large oil reserves, a joint Exxon Chinese oil company venture. Interesting complexities there. We're ha we have signed an ag agreement, a logistics agreement, sharing agreement with the Guyanese Defense Force. It's open to the media. First question out of the box, Admiral Fowler, would you please comment on China's distant PRC's distant water fleet illegally fishing here in the Caribbean waters <laughs> uh, and how that's impacting Guyana? I said, well, I would leave any answer on the impacts of sovereignty of Guyana to my hosts, now putting the chief of defense on the spot with the Minister of Defense <laughs> and presidential advisor in the front row. But I could comment on what's happening in Ecuador. And I went through the vignette, and I even went as far to say is why isn't more being written about it, what's happening in Ecuador? It's because we've uncovered evidence where PRC officials have paid local media to not write about it. Before the press conference was over, there was an op-ed in, in all the papers by the, the PRC ambassador to Guyana. And it's shown the light on past U U.S. Southern Command human rights violations and the U.S.'s long history of abuse. And so there's this, this play on this development. There's also a play on the 100 years of humiliation and Latin America's you know, perceived second-tier status under you know, previous ways that may or may not have been looked at in U.S. policy uh, that you know, may resident with, resident, uh, resonate with some audiences, but I think rings hollow to what we're actually doing today and what we represent. But it is a, a, a media operation that's pretty active. Thanks. OK, I think we're going to transition now uh, to some questions from our audience, both here um, in the room and also online. So for those in the room, if you have any questions, please come up to the mic, uh, and you can ask your question. All right. Just because we have 119 participants online, we're going to ask folks to come to the podium so you can be on camera. Uh, first of all, uh, Bob Rosenberg. Um, I, I think it's very important uh, to um, provide some way to have the people of the country that we're dealing with uh, be better off uh, because of their involvement with us in terms of their own lives. How do they see that? And so um, what can be done and what is being done uh, along with that to uh, to uh, help boost that area of, of the involvement in the country. Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's really core to the, the broader um, premise for our engagement and relationships in, in the region, which is, um, you know, our shared appreciation and commitment to democracy. Um, and so being attentive to um, the uh, needs and, um, you know, desires of, of the people of, of the region um, and ensuring that their governments are accountable to that um, as we are to, to our own um, is, is critical to ensure that the cooperation we're, we're trying to promote is actually um, one of integrity um, and that we're actually living up to, to our values in, in that sense. Um, if I can actually connect um, this in, in terms of specifics to a question that I also saw in, in the chat in terms of, um, you know, are there other tools that we can lead with that are maybe more reflective of our values um, and not just, um, you know, transactional foreign military sales? 
Um, Craig mentioned earlier women, peace and security as, as one great example. Um, I would highlight um, the core themes of the Conference of the Defense Ministers of the Americas as um, I think a really great way to illustrate um, both points um, raised uh, both in the chat and, and by our uh, uh, guest per participant just now. Um, those include um, humanitarian assistance and, and disaster relief. It includes um, the effects of, of climate change. Um, it includes uh, cyber attacks that you know certainly aren't just a threat from a government perspective, but in the day-to-day -day, uh, lives and experiences of, of uh, the, the population. Um, and then, as, as Craig mentioned, um, the women, peace, and security, um, you know, being, um, I think, an area of focus that is of great value, uh, both within partner militaries in the region and in the broader population. Um, so I think, you know, the, the areas that we are emphasizing through our defense engagement are reflective of what our partners want to, want to see, and I think very conducive and reflective of um, the, the fact that we are all uh, democracies uh, that uh, share common values. One of the most significant things I did as director of operations at CENTCOM, the Syria crisis, it's a UN refugee camp in Jordan, we went and visited, what do you need? We need a water well. Can we get this done? We can get this done. Within weeks, if not years, we helped find a way to fund and drill a well. And you build trust one well at a time, one educational class at a time. The, the greatest, if, if someone said to me, what was the last thing you'd ever want to take away? Well, that's a tough question because things are integrated in our ability to deal with uh, and help partners. But it's our education system, professional military IMET education. And from 1978, when it wasn't very popular to apply to the military when I submitted my application post-Vietnam, we have emphasized that professionalism in our ranks time and time again, and it's paid off in terms of the trust we've been able to build around the world. Not perfect, we've made missteps, but we make plenty of more forward steps than we do backward steps. Thank you. Thank you. Your name and um, yes, my name is uh, Martin Rodriguez. Thank you for being here. Thank you for putting uh, this great event together, Guido. My question is, um, there seems to be an insufficiency in a U.S. irregular warfare doctrine when it comes to the drug war. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, how do you assess the Chinese uh, threat on originated, uh, originated fentanyl in the border, its connection with Mexico. And uh, it seems to me that the situation, particularly now at the border, uh, the number of apprehensions that we have right now, uh, it's uh, a fertile ground for gray zone activity. So I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, and thank you for being here. Right, looking at me. <laughs> it's, a, it's an excellent question. I said in earlier remarks that the PRC has, has created the most intense, sophisticated, intrusive surveillance system in the history of the world. Uh, the, the cartels, the drug organizations, thrive on money laundering and illicit forms of finance. Uh, one of the main sources of that is, um, is uh, Chinese company money laundering. And so is there a direct connection to the government of PRC in this? Undoubtedly hard to, hard to see, but given the sophistication and the ability of the PRC to shut things down. If they wanted to participate in a cooperative global effort to shut this down, it would be welcome and it's needed. Thank you. So I'm gonna take a, a question from our online audience right now. Um, and I think we'll start off with, uh, with Dr. Berg, because I'd like to hear your, your perspective on how we educate uh, these people. But then I wanna pivot back to Assistant Secretary Dalton on what DOD can do. So the question is, um, many journalists in Latin America, not only Latin America, but many in Latin America are unaware of China's predatory strategies of influence. How could the US help in improving awareness in the region, specifically to the PRC's influence operations using media, social media, and things of that nature? Well, it's a, that's a great question. I think it's, uh, I think it's twofold. It kind of comes back to, uh, to partnership as well. The first thing is, and something I've been absolutely astounded by, is we've had the notion throughout this conversation that fundamentally Latin America and the Caribbean is not 
any different than any other part of the world in terms of how the PRC is going to behave. So one thing we've, we've spent a little bit of time looking at at CSIS is actually how uh, the PRC engages with media in Africa. And I think it's pretty illustrative of how they're going to engage with media, uh, are starting to, and how they will continue to engage with media in Latin America and the Caribbean. They have all sorts of programs to bring folks to Beijing, right? And I'm not just talking about like a three week, you know, National Endowment for Democracy type of program where you're gonna, you know, spend some nice time in DC and eat some good meals, meet some cool people and then go home. It's like a 10 month program. I'm talking about a, you know, $1,000 a month stipend, um, all sorts of cultural tours, et cetera. Uh, but beyond the, the sort of soft power angle, there's journalistic training. Right? And what, and what uh, the PRC is pushing is investigative journalism is actually not how you're supposed to do things, right? The West is, you know, the, the US and European countries are, are really pushing um, investigative journalism. You should critique leaders, you should hold them to account. There's actually a philosophy, a philosophical difference uh, that, they're, that they're teaching journalists in some of these exchange programs, which is to say, you are actually part of the problem if you are engaging in that sort of takedown, kind of accountability-oriented journalism because you are preventing the nation from developing. Instead, what you should be doing is messaging the good deeds that the state is engaged in, right? You should help build up the nation as opposed to tearing it down. And what investigative journalism does is too often critique and tear down and make societies polarized and not, and not unified. Right? So fundamentally uh, uh, at odds with what we conceive the, the free press to, to be for in, in, in democracy, which is to hold leaders ideally absolutely to account for, for their actions. Um, that's something that, you know, we haven't seen it to the same extent as we've seen in Africa, in Latin America, and the Caribbean, but if it does come, uh, that could be a, a total game changer in terms of, in terms of giving the, the advantage uh, to, to China. Um, on, the, on the media front. Um, in terms of the awareness piece, um, I've testified a couple times on this specific issue in front of both Senate and, and House that I think we should have like a dashboard, right? We should have a US government website that tracks uh, Chinese, uh, particularly Chinese economic engagement in, in the hemisphere and gets to some of the downsides of or corrosive elements of that engagement to Assistant Secretary Dalton's point. The environmental degradation, the corruption, the number of aborted projects, uh, the debt, right? If it was more widely known that for every $1 of aid, China adds $9 of debt and al revés, the exact opposite for, for the US, for every uh, $1 of debt, it gives $9 of assistance. That's a, that's a pretty powerful narrative. Right? The fact that the only people who have put that narrative out are scholars at William and Mary at the Aid Data Center is a problem, right? We need to have some kind of, some kind of transparency dashboard, some kind of uh, uh, public accounting of what China is up to in the hemisphere with the BRI, with the Global Security Initiative, the Global Defense Initiative, so that reporters have a font of, of, of information that they can go to. Because right now I fear that there are too many disparate sources for, the, for journalists to be able to collect all of the information they need to get the complete picture, because we're dealing with something that's so complex. Yeah, right. uh, I, it's a, something just to tag on it. I, it's a great idea. We, we were in a, a country in South America, asked the chief defense, hey, what, 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 get to the end of the conversation, lots of listening, lots of tea. Hey, what are you doing with China? Ah, oh, you know, not much. I had gone into the guest registry and I had seen that the Chinese ambassador was coming over to see him every quarter for, um, for uh, lunch. And I asked him about that and he said, oh, oh yeah, that. He said, well, they offer me 10 uh, cyber scholarships every two years uh, for my uh, 3,000 person military. Uh, it's a two year full immersion, Mandarin, cyber engineering and the defense attache didn't know, no one else knew just kind of uncovered because I you know, pointed to the guest book. There's, a, there's a, we, we kind of thrive on transparency. That's not a Chinese value and it's not always in the best interest of a partner when they're dealing with China to be transparent and uncover things that should go on a dashboard. Secretary Dalton. Hey, I know we're, we're a little short and we're gonna get into closing comments soon, but really if you could provide, now that we've kind of heard 
uh, from Dr. Berg and Admiral Fowler on that. What can the department do to counter or compete in the information domain uh, with the PRC? Um, I think, first of all, um, it's, it's worth thinking about who is the right messenger um, for these uh, types of uh, disclosures or um, you know, to promote that type of transparency. Um, certainly, there are tools that um, the, the department has. Um, are we always the right messenger for certain messages, I think, is, is an important question. Um, certainly, when we have concerns about what um, the PRC is intending to do in the region or potential dual use um, capabilities or facilities, we raise them in our um, engagements um, through the robust partnerships that, that we have. Um, but I think, you know, getting more information out as a general principle uh, as to what the PRC is up to in the hemisphere, um, we definitely lean, need to lean into more. Um, and I think key for our partners is that critical nexus where they may perceive it as impinging upon their sovereignty. Um, and so, you know, within that playbook that we see the PRC using globally, how is that manifesting in a particular country? And how is that chafing, um, you know, their 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 sovereignty? Um, so I think, you know, some good food for thought there in terms of who's who's the right messenger, um, what are the right messages, and um, can we draw that connection to uh, sovereignty? Thank you. Okay, so so the spectrum of conflict uh, is comprised of cooperation, competition, crisis, and conflict. Uh, we hope to stay within that cooperation and competition space. Uh, but as we see tensions with the PRC continue to rise, uh, for your closing remarks, each of you, uh, I'd like for you to really give us your perspective on the strategic value, one of the Western Hemisphere, but also what do you foresee its role playing during a conflict situation uh, in the Indo-Pacific with the PRC? Um, we can start with you, Secretary Dalton. Well, thanks again for, for the opportunity to, to join the, the panel. Um, it's been a great discussion. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we benefit from in this region. Um, we don't have the prospect of major military conflict as we do with the PRC, um, particularly in, in the Indo-Pacific. We benefit from having strong partnerships um, and that foundation of shared values, common interests as, as democracies. But we also can't take that for granted. Um, in terms of the need for sustained engagement for robust security cooperation, defense institution building that um, amplifies and, and builds upon that strong foundation of, of common interests and, and values. How we, we harness that approach with a, in the broader framework of whole of government, whole of society, working with the private sector, working with academia. Um, there's just a lot of work that, that needs to be done, um, but we also can't boil the ocean um, in terms of competing everywhere. So where are the really targeted avenues and opportunities that we have in the region to capitalize upon where there is shared political will, um, where there is a, a perception that um, sovereignty is being impinged upon. Um, and we can marshal, uh, you know, the collective uh, authorities and tools to, to bring to bear to, to compete effectively. Thanks. Thank you. Emma Fowler? It's a great question. Uh, I think that these competitions, global, what's happening right now, the PRC's setting the stage for their continued march towards their form of democracy. I've heard it described as illiberal democracy. It looks a lot like a dictatorship to me. <laughs> and I, I think that it, in that global conflict, we may not see bullets or missiles flying in this hemisphere, but we'll see cyber fires, or we won't see them. And this type of access that's being, that the stage is being set, uh, Melissa mentioned 17 ports. Uh, she mentioned the space, deep space, the only deep space station that uh, PLA um, operates outside of mainland uh, China in this hemisphere. Uh, those things will come into critical play. The, the critical waterways and choke points will come into play. The resources that are needed to sustain an effort will come into play. And so we have to recognize that now and set into to motion uh, enhanced agreements, enhanced understanding of partnerships, enhancing uh, uh, partnerships. 
I agree we can't boil the ocean everywhere, everywhere, but we can't prioritize our way out of partners either. I see, unfortunately, that trend, and I saw that trend uh, in my time as Southcom. And often that prioritization was formulatic, formulatically made based on almost a bias towards the linear distance from Beijing, and in the case of Russia, Moscow, uh, not with an, an emphasis on the key strategic value of that partnership in the future or the key strategic value holistically across all elements of national power. It would be maybe only looked on for what would they bring to the U.S. in a defense capability. Uh, this, the second point is Defense Department is not the one to lead uh, this forward motion on being the best athlete, the best partner out there. It has to be led by our diplomats. We, we have this acronym DIME. It translates horribly in Spanish. <laughs> uh, but you know, D is for diplomacy, information. It should be S, but DICE is even worse. S should be for security, not military, and E for economic. The M needs to be really, really small. And often we, we rely on the M because we have a can-do culture and we've got uh, an energetic force and we, we go get things done. Um, and so we've got to hold back from taking the lead and, and enable and encourage our interagency partners to do the same. And, and finally, we just doing simple things like getting our ambassadors confirmed, which we are horrific at, um, getting a budget approved on time. When we don't get a budget approved on time, that whipsaw means that we've got to spend a year's worth of security cooperation in, what, four months, Melissa, sometimes? And then when we go to grade ourselves on how well we did in spending it, our assessments are poor because you can't effectively uh, uh, utilize a 12-month program in four or less. And sometimes we even skip whole years because we just could never get it done. It's Partners don't understand how the, the number one global uh, power that they want to emulate can be so uh, inept in bureaucratic processes <laughs> sometimes. Thanks, Admiral. Ryan, you have the last word here for the panelists. OK, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Guido, for the, for the event. Thanks, Assistant Secretary Dalton, for your participation. Admiral Fowler, for yours as well. Uh, this has been a terrific conversation. Um, just real quickly on the on the Western Hemisphere angle, not to reiterate too much what my colleagues have said, but uh, you know this is a critical piece of great power competition, strategic rivalry uh, moving forward, not just in the current moment we're in now. Uh, even as I mentioned at the outset, even if we've um, underinvested and sort of thought sometimes or, or strategic thinking on the Western Hemisphere, we've always understood in the back of our minds that this is the most likely vector for 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 insecurity uh, for, for the United States. So um, no other region of the world is, is more important in, in terms of that. Uh, there's definitely something to the tidy neighborhood theory. Um, the idea that if the United States is, is inhabiting a, a, a neighborhood of uh, Pacific countries that are economically integrated, prosperous, um, and not at war with, with one another, or not, not in major security dilemmas with one another, that that's an anchor of our power projection capability and influence further afield, right? So that's the, that's the critical piece of the, the Western Hemisphere. In terms of the conflict uh, situation, because you asked kind of a two-part question, Guido, and I, I'm going to assume that the conflict is, is over Taiwan. Um, we've got seven countries in the hemisphere that rec recognize Taiwan, right? That implicates the hemisphere in any sort of Taiwan uh, contingency, even if we're unlikely to see things extend to um, to, to, to the Western Hemisphere. Um, there would be consequences for some of our partners in the region who recognize Taiwan. Um, if I could offer sort of in closing remarks just a couple thoughts on where we might take this, and this is a shameful plug because we have a report coming out in two days, which is kind of a grand strategy piece on how we deal with China in, in, in the hemisphere. Um, because we're sort of scholars and you make your name as a scholar by having a trendy slogan. Uh, the slogan is insulate, curtail, compete. Um, so we want to insulate our partners against some of the corrosive effects of, of this engagement. And that means doing some of the things that we're doing already, helping partners build better judicial systems, anti-corruption campaigns, cyber capabilities, things that help them fortify themselves domestically against uh, Chinese PRC gray zone activity. There's the curtailment piece, which is, uh, to Melissa's point, you can't boil the ocean, right? So you pick your three to five priority areas and have very sound reasons for them. 
Um, and then you make that critical ask. You message it well, and you make that critical ask of our partners. You know, don't go with, with China on this one or have us as your preferred partner. And then ideally, you marry curtailment strategies with competition. You put some real resources, skin in the game, and being able to make an alternative viable so that it's not just complaining without a, without a viable alternative. If we just do curtailment and we say don't go with China, as has been mentioned in this conversation already, we're not serious. Right? We're not serious and we're not actually offering the alternative that the region needs to develop and meet its needs. But if we marry that with competition strategies and real resources from institutions like the Development Finance Corporation, USAID, and most importantly, I would add the US private sector, um, we're in business, right? And we, we can compete and compete effectively. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, this has been a fascinating discussion. I can't believe 90 minutes kind of flew by and we're even past time at this point, but really appreciate uh, everyone's contributions. Uh, Assistant Secretary Dalton, Admiral Fowler, uh, Dr. Berg, uh, appreciate you guys coming in, having this discussion. I think we could have done this for hours, but luckily we'll, we'll pause there, maybe reconvene. I think we'll have some papers that come out for, for some policy <laughs> recommendations in the future as we talk about. Easy for you to see, Guido. You're asking all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> hours. Come on. So Thanks thanks. So um, appreciate just, it. Just, right. good. Just uh, for, the, for the record here, uh, this session, again, has been recorded via on the Belfer uh, Center's website down the road and on the Regular Warfare Initiative's website. I would also go to IWI's website for a whole bunch of IWI content uh, and the